so thanks everybody for joining the NSF Arctic section today. I'm Kate Rock. I'm a contractor to the Arctic section uh, through a company called QED Enterprises Inc. Uh, with the logistics section. And today's going to be kind of a combo of the kind of usual AGU office hours where there's some introductory and updates to the program as long as um, kind of an update to operations with uh, with relation to, to COVID and how that's been impacting um, NSF. So I'll pass it over to Simon, who's I think online and maybe he can move through the introductions with everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, all right, good. So uh, this is one of the few occasions they allow me to speak, um, but all I'm doing is introducing the rest of team so uh, we go through in more or less the order that uh, you see on the screen uh, if everybody's here um, so starting with uh, Colleen Hafty from our ANS program I don't think we have Colleen today so maybe we can go to Mark all right so to to Mark then hi I'm Mark Stiglitz and I'm program director in Arctic natural sciences all right, great. Roberto? Everyone, Roberto Gata here, um, program director for Arctic Observing Network and also part of the Navigating the New Arctic Working Group. Great. And then um, I think we're also missing Erica, so we can go to, and we're missing Erica and Greg, so we can go to Colleen. So let me just, uh, actually, let me go back to Colleen. So Colleen joined us uh, earlier in the year. Um, uh, before COVID, uh, BC is that uh, okay? So, um, to, uh, and she had been uh, part of the team in the Antarctic program. Left to go to NASA. Was a assistant program director at NASA for the Chrysler program, and we were very happy to be able to entice her back to ANS. Um, to, uh, to help out uh, Mark. Um, and I should say, you know, we've actually had a lot of turnover um, in the last uh, in the last uh, year. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's some new names here. Erica Hill, uh, we, we pulled her in from uh, Alaska, the University of Alaska Southeast, so, um, and to run the social science program had been a bit of a gap there um, where uh, Roberto and Colleen Strohacker filled in, but now we have a, a full-time uh, program director in Erica uh, to, um, uh, to run the social science program. Uh, and, uh, and so that's very helpful. Greg, uh, unfortunately, is uh, not able to join us. Uh, he's a uh, an old hand at NSF, but a relatively new uh, person for the Arctic Science section and has been in the System Science program. And with that, I'll uh, slip over to, uh, to Colleen Strohacker. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling in from. I'm Colleen Strohacker, a program officer for the Arctic System Science program and navigating the new Arctic. Very good, thanks. Uh, Frank? Hi, I'm Frank Rack, um, Program Manager for uh, the P2C2 program, which is under the Arctic Natural Sciences uh, program. And I'm also a Program Manager for Research Support and Logistics for Alaska and Vessels. Very good, thanks, Frank. Alan? Hey everyone, I'm Alan Pope. I'm program director for Polar Cyber Infrastructure. So I've only been at NSF for what, 10 weeks now, um, but it's a joint program between Arctic and Antarctic. So technically part of me sits in the Antarctic section, but oh uh, yeah, half of the Polar Cyber program is Arctic as well. Thanks. Great Alan. And um, as you'll sort of see with this, that uh, we, we, do not clear, we do not keep clear boundaries between people's portfolios. So Frank is helping in the science side. Uh, Alan is helping in the cyber infrastructure side, but will be drawn into other aspects of the programs uh, as we can you know, benefit from his uh, expertise. Um, 
Uh, Renee, I'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Renee Crane. I'm a program manager with the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program and the Arctic Research and Policy Program. And I think we're going to say a little bit more later about the uh, policy side of the, the program here. Uh, Pat, are you with us? Yes, uh, I'm another uh, program manager with the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Group. I focus on the infrastructure sorts of things and uh, management systems, and lately, IT security. Very good. Jennifer? Hi, everyone. Um, greetings in all the time zones. I'm Jennifer Mercer. I'm a program manager in Arctic Research Support and Logistics. Um, and I oversee all of our Greenland operations. I'm also the contracting office representative on our um, prime support contract with Battelle Arctic Research Operations. And as Simon said, sometimes the lines are a little blurry. So I do manage some of our science awards in Aon with Roberto. And I think we're gonna say a little bit more about logistics and the contractor uh, later in the presentation. Is that, is that right, uh, Jen? Yes. We are. Okay, good. I, I don't know if we have Lisa. Normally, uh, she's on uh, vacation this week. Lisa, are you here? No, we're missing Katya as well. So. And uh, you said, and not Katya? Yeah, she couldn't make it either. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we've been, you know, very lucky to have uh, AAAS fellows over the last uh, decade and Katya is our current AAAS fellow who, uh, who gets a, a broad array of uh, tasks from any of the program directors really. And also the interagency. Uh, so this is, you know, this meeting is sponsored by the IOPIC and uh, Katya plays a very useful role there. And Lisa has been our education program director uh, for some time now. She also has portfolios in the Antarctic program and also ocean sciences. Um, so, um, and she works very, very closely with the NSS uh, Education and Human Resources Directorate uh, to, you know, to fund the, the projects that we, we do end up funding in the education. So please do reach out to, to Lisa um, but that's the, that's the team we have with us, and um, I think we, uh, I hand it back to you, Kate. We also have Bev Walker, too, if Bev wants to introduce herself. Hi, um, good day, everyone. My name is Bev Walker. I'm a science analyst with the Office of Polar Programs, um, so I do work with um, both polar groups, um, and uh, perhaps of interest, I'm, I'm working with our subcommittee that's a part of our advisory committee that is working on diversity and inclusion for our uh, polar research community. Thanks, Thanks Bev. And that's, uh, that's an important piece, uh, which I'm not sure we cover again uh, in this presentation about uh, diversity and inclusion. So please, uh, we, need to, we need to give folks uh, Bev's coordinates for that. If they, uh, if they have input. Back to you, Kate. Thanks, and thanks everybody. Uh, so next it's gonna be a brief, um, just overview of all the different programs that are covered in this new solicitation. So Mark, do you wanna briefly go over ANS? Yeah, so ANS um, supports hypothesis-driven, process-based science, um, the results of which would provide an understanding of the larger Arctic system. I would say that it, it tends to focus on um, smaller collaborations, um, either one person or just a few in many cases. I would say that, um, you know, I would say that its costs usually are less than, than many, but because of the logistics, that's not always the case. So, um, so I think that's about it. The real focus is hypothesis driven and process, process based science. And it can support across the fields, oceanography, cryo, uh, glaciology, 
atmospheric science, terrestrial hydrology and ecology, um, and a host of others. Great, are you, uh, Roberto, you wanna do Anne? Sure, thanks, Kate. So um, I'll just say sort of three main things about the Arctic Observing Network or AON program. Um, that's that it supports proposals to make field observations to detect and understand Arctic system change occurring on timescales longer than the duration of a typical NSF research grant. And so AON can fund awards up to five years. Um, and in some cases, there's potential for renewals if the projects demonstrate uh, utility in terms of the data that they're generating. I'll also say that AON projects are expected to address major drivers and impacts of system change and generate data that are intended for wider use by the scientific research community, uh, specifically in understanding the changing Arctic system. And um, if folks have an opportunity to look at the awards uh, database, they'll, they'll note that AON awards include, but are not limited to observations on atmospheric, community-based, freshwater, marine, and terrestrial systems. So a little bit of everything to help us understand and detect uh, environmental change. Thanks. Yeah, and then since we don't have uh, Erica today, would you and Colleen mind uh, also doing the social science program? Yeah, I can just take the two in a row and <laughs> that'll be easiest, I think. Um, so as um, Simon mentioned, Dr. Erica Hill is our program officer for the Arctic Social Sciences Program, um, but uh, Roberto and I cover any conflicts of interest that Erica and I have, so we help out um, when is needed. And as the name of the program suggests, um, it really supports the study of any type of social science that um, can be studied in the Arctic. So. Um, these, uh, if you go to the NSF website, we have an entire directorate <laughs> devoted to social behavioral and economic sciences. So this program will fund anything that that directorate is willing to fund. And we also are really quite interested um, in supporting um, research that has to do with the co-production of knowledge or indigenous led research as well. Um, and uh, the Arctic Social Sciences Program has a long history of supporting that research. So if you're interested in learning more, um, definitely reach out to Erica and she can certainly tell you, um, provide more information on that program. And also I, I co-lead um, the Arctic System Science Program with Dr. Gregory Anderson, who couldn't be here today. Um, and as once again, we are, are the names of our programs are really well, dis <laughs> good descriptors of what we wanna find is that we are, we support projects that um, study systems of the Arctic operating at multiple temporal and spatial scales, um, systems that can inform our understanding of Arctic processes. And, and a new foci of the ARCS program is that we are also really interested in supporting research that has to do with socio-ecological systems, human environment interactions as well. And I know, I think we have another slide with more programs, but I know these are kind of our four core science programs. Um, and as you probably heard, as Mark Roberto and I described them, you can imagine that there might be quite a bit of overlap among them since all of these programs really do represent a microcosm of the entirety of what NSF funds. Um, so I know sometimes PIs can get confused on where exactly their proposal um, could fit and it actually might fit in multiple different programs. Um, and so we, uh, all of the program officers are really interested in talking to PIs um, about where your pro project can live, whether it's ARCs and ANS, ARCs and AON, ARCs and Arctic Social Sciences, AON and ANS. Um, there's a, a number of different uh, ways. And in fact, the section, all the programs have co-funded um, some uh, co-funded awards at different times. So feel free to reach out um, if you're confused on where your project may live. Thanks, and then we'll move on to, I think we have a couple more program descriptions. Uh, so Alan, for Polar Cyber. Yeah. yeah, so building on what Colleen just said, Polar Cyber kind of crosses all of the boundaries and hopefully facilitates all of the boundaries as well. So um, it's new that Polar Cyber infrastructure has been added back into the Arctic Research Opportunity Solicitation. Colleen will cover more on that later, but Polar Cyber infrastructure basically supports almost anything at the intersection of computing and Arctic science and building that capacity within the Arctic science community and facilitating Arctic science. And so that could mean things like data transfer, curatorship, visualization and analysis, interoperability across disciplines, high performance computing resources, or e-learning and educational tools that have cyber infrastructure components. Um, yeah, and so, you know, regular proposals can be part of this, as well as things like workshops and, and other opportunities as well. So, thanks. Thanks. And then uh, Renee for the coordination policy support. Sure. New in our solicitation that we recently released is the Arctic Research Coordination and Policy Support Program. 
and uh, this program is really to enhance efforts that are um, going to improve communication, coordination, and collaboration across the research enterprise. It's an opportunity to um, deepen engagement with indigenous or tribal organizations. And projects um, should focus on developing capacity and new, new approaches, synthesize results, um, do things that are not necessarily appropriate for the more hypothesis-driven programs, but that really contribute to our understanding of the Arctic to our engagement with indigenous people um, and produce things that may be useful to decision makers. Uh, one example of a program that would be funded or a project that would be funded by this program is the study of environmental Arctic change search that some of you may have heard of um, to give you a sense of the type of project that might be appropriate for this pro program. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I got a little trigger happy on the slides. I also forgot that we had a poll for you guys. <laughs> um, some questions just so that uh, program officers could get a sense of who was in the audience today. So Liz is gonna do that now. And then um, I think once you answer, it'll go away from your screen. So um, if you guys could take the time just to answer both those questions, we would also really appreciate it. And then um, Colleen Strahgecker is going to move into introducing uh, the new solicitation for Arctic. Yeah, thanks, Kate. And I would um, encourage you all to fill out the poll if you feel comfortable. I think we really um, are trying to collect as much data about how we can help you um, at NSF um, move through the challenges that we're facing with COVID-19. And, and we'll cover some more of that in um, a future slide as well. And Liz um, just said in the chat that the poll is anonymous. So that is a great way to um, help us just better understand how we can support you. So um, this year, a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, the Arctic, the entire section, um, Simon, can you go ahead and mute yourself? Actually, thanks. Um, so we actually just revised and updated our um, kind of core solicitation that the Section for Arctic Sciences has for you to submit proposals to. And I actually popped um, links in the chat for you for both the new Arctic Research Opportunity Solicitation and the new NNA solicitation as well. And if my colleagues at NSF have any other links that they think is important, feel free to, to pop those in too. Um, so this is actually the first update that we've had in about five years. And um, I think it also reflects um, some of the new program officers that we have in the section two and some of the new foci um, that we wanna see um, supported um, by NSF in, in Arctic science. Um, so primarily we went and we updated all the script descriptions of the program. So we actually um, just went over all of the programs. Um, they've actually been slightly enhanced, um, changed, edited based on kind of what we would like to encourage the community to think about in terms of where they to submit proposals to. Uh, we also have added um, in addition of a, a new proposal called large project support proposal type, this was previously called research project overview. And I think um, the way it was described in the past was a little bit confusing. Um, so we um, kind of renamed it large project support proposal. Um, it's really well described in the solicitation. Um, there are a number of different things, large field campaigns, um, big data analysis that you can think about. I, I would encourage you to be creative about it after um, reading through that, um, that text in the solicitation, but it might give you as PIs more opportunities to think about um, how your projects may fit into the solicitation. Um, in the previous solicitation, we limited um, PI, the number of PI submissions to both the Arctic Natural Science and Arctic System Science program. We have removed those, so please submit us for any um, well-prepared and ready-to-go proposals as you want. Don't worry about any of those um, PI limitations anymore. We have also expanded the section on guidance for coordination and collaborations with Arctic and indigenous communities. As many of you are aware, um, we have spent a lot of time talking about this, both in the section, in Arctic research as a whole, in the IARPIC space. Um, and so we thought we would, it would be a good idea to formalize some of that um, information in um, the solicitation. And I see um, that the poll is has um, results have been shared. Liz, can everyone see all of these or just the um, host? Everyone can see them. Okay, great. So it seems like I'll just go over them really quick. So um, we, people, 
don't miss any important information. So it seems like we have a lot of mid-career and advanced career people online. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad you're still here. Feel free to pass this information on to all of your students and postdocs too. I know this will be um, recorded. So it's a really great source of information. Um, and it seems like some of the biggest impacts to COVID-19, um, yeah, access to facilities at, home, at your home institution labs, I'm sure. Delayed field work is a biggie. We will talk um, more about that. Our RSL team will talk more about that and impacts to your career projects and uh, progress. And I know a lot of um, our PIs and uh, potential PIs are really worried about the support for their early career colleagues. Um, so thanks again for answering that. Um, it really helps us a lot, try to figure out what we can do um, within the section to help you um, deal with this crisis. Okay, now going back to the major revisions now. So um, as we just said in the previous slide, we've also added back in um, the Polar Cyber Infrastructure Program. Um, Dr. Alan Pope, again, will be your contact for that. And then the Arctic Research Coordination and Policy Support Programs that um, Renee covered. Um, so those are um, new programs in the solicitation that you can again read the um, the, the descriptions of those and, and figure out if you have a proposal you would like to submit to those. Um, and we have information about working with the new prime logistics contractor, which um, our RSL team will go over in a couple of slides. And I think I'll do NNA too, right, Kate? Okay, so in addition to Arctic research opportunities, many of you are familiar with um, the Navigating the New Arctic program, which is not directly housed in our section, but is um, at the geo directorate level. And um, both uh, Dr. Roberto Delgado, um, Dr. Greg Anderson, and myself are the program officers from the section for Arctic sciences that are working on this. Um, and Navigating the New Arctic is one of um, NSF's 10 big ideas. And really um, the, the big thing to think about in NNA is that we are really um, looking to support convergence type research um, to uh, understand and address profound challenges in the Arctic and their local and global effects. So you see on the right there, we have the kind of, um, the hopefully you're all familiar now with the NNA Venn diagram in which we really want to see proposals that are operating at the intersection of the social systems, built environment, and natural um, environment. And then you can see the six focus areas of NNA around that Venn diagram. So we have a new solicitation that is out. Proposals are due March 5th of next year. You can see the contact information there. And I believe the next slide has the major updates to that solicitation. Kate, if you can go ahead and and change that, thank you. Um, and so we actually worked really hard on updating the solicitation. We're really excited um, about um, some of the new opportunities in the solicitation. This is um, NNA's third year that it's been around out of a planned five years. And so we wanted to figure out now that we have two or three years of, of awards behind us, how can we kind of help the community, the NNA community grow? So we, we still have our planning grants. Um, the budget for that used to be $250,000 over the course of two years. We've increased that to $300,000. So we can, um, we know Arctic travel is very expensive. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility um, if you wanna hold meetings or, or visit with people. Uh, we still have our research grants up to $3 million over five years, but we've added a new opportunity called collaboratory grants. Again, this is very well described in the solicitation. Um, we left it pretty open-ended, but as you can see here, um, there is no budget limit and a maximum duration of five years. We know that budgets will really um, vary for collaboratories, but we wanted to give the NNA community um, a, a space to figure out some really innovative projects in which people are working together um, at this convergence space to really think about um, how they can move forward um, with these big ideas in NNA. So it might be a field campaign. It may be some kind of synthesis center. Um, I am giving these examples, but we are not limited to those at all. Again, the solicitation is very open-ended. We are looking for creative creative ideas um, and feel free to reach out to the program officers if you have any questions at all. We know the collaboratory grant will probably bring up a lot of questions for you and we're happy to answer those. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Roberto. Thanks, Colleen. That's a great setup for, uh, in fact, describing the major revisions to the NNA solicitation a little bit more, more in, in depth. Um, and I'll start with, with this new uh, NNA collaboratory grant. So it's a third track uh, in addition to the original planning and research grants. Um, and as Colleen indicated, 
um, you know, there's something new and different, really allowing for innovations and, and flexibilities in, in PI's ideas. And so, um, and I'll just outline that collaboratories are intended to encourage the research community to organize, collaborate on wide reaching themes related to the Arctic. Um, ideally, uh, I think these collaborative grants will provide a foundation for the cultivation of long-term ideas, collaborations, research syntheses, investments in the future of convergent science, which is really uh, a grounding for, for NNA, uh, specifically in the context of Arctic change. Um, and as Colleen said, um, you know, we leave some of the language a little bit um, open to interpretation. Uh, we intend there to be diverse approaches, objectives, foci, and activities. Um, and we trust that everyone will read the solicitation carefully and go through the frequently asked questions or the FAQs. And once you've read through that, then you can uh, approach the NNA program officers uh, with inquiries uh, to, to help discuss some of your, your proposed concepts. So we look forward to, to that engagement. Um, a few of the other major revisions for the new NA solicitation this year include um, an increase in the page limit for the management integration plan. That's a requirement for NNA proposals. Typically, uh, these are you know, complex research and or planning uh, proposals that are submitted. And uh, it's really important to have uh, sufficient space to, to adequately describe and uh, clarify how, how the projects will be managed and the different components integrated with one another. So this year, we're allowing up to six pages, which is a, a, a good sizable increase. Um, along the lines of that, uh, giving opportunity for, for additional input, um, we are no longer limiting the number of submissions per PI, again, allowing for, for individuals who are involved in, in multiple types of projects to, to be able to, to submit uh, you know, um, those different uh, proposals, um, depending on, on their workloads and, and, and balance. Um, one interesting administrative change for the coming year is that proposals will need to be prepared and submitted through research.gov instead of Fastlane, which perhaps many of you are, are quite familiar with. Um, Perhaps it may not directly impact all of you in the same way. Uh, your sp respective sponsored research offices or your authorized organizational representatives uh, could be good resources at your institutions to help you with the, the, the proposal preparation submission through, through research.gov if you're not already familiar with, with using that interface. Um, Colleen mentioned earlier that the budget, the maximum budget for the NA planning grants has increased to $300,000. Again, we all know uh, the increased expenditures of, of traveling in the Arctic, although uh, many of us we're not able to travel this past year, uh, but we are all cautiously optimistic that um, operations and field deployments might be possible in the coming year. Um, and so we are allowing for increased budget uh, for, for, for the planning grants in order to, to, to get people together. Um, and lastly, uh, more so in, in for our, our, our reviewer and panelist population, but also as, as guidance to the submitting uh, principal investigators, uh, we are clarifying and have streamlined uh, those solicitation specific review criteria. So of course, all of you uh, should be familiar with that the two National Science Board approved review criteria, merit review criteria include intellectual merit and broader impacts. And then there are some more specific NNA uh, criteria that, that address the, the convergence approach and specific research themes and goals um, that you can find in the solicitation. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Cool. Um, I'll talk about a few other opportunities that, oh, I'm jumping in too soon. Sorry. Go ahead, Roberto. Actually, yeah. yeah. That's right. I got ahead I, I, of I, myself. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I can get started on this next one as well. So in addition to the revised Arctic Research Opportunities Solicitation and uh, the new FY21 NNA solicitation, there are a number of other funding opportunities available um, that are, are there directly sort of supported through Arctic Sciences or polar programs, uh, but also from, from other divisions and other programs throughout the National Science Foundation. Um, one of these is the Arctic Doctoral Dissertation Research Improvement Grant, uh, or the Arctic DDRIG. Um, and we have a, a new solicitation that was published um, earlier this calendar year uh, that adds Arctic system sciences and the Arctic Observing Network to, um, to the program, to, to this, this opportunity. Previously, only the Arctic social sciences accepted and reviewed doctoral dissertation research improvement grants for, for Arctic sciences. Um, also, within the last few months, um, we published a dear colleague letter uh, titled Potential Support for Community Hubs for Collaborations between SF-funded Arctic researchers and Arctic residents. Um, essentially, 
encourages submissions that, that tie into research relevant activities, including strengthening uh, community engagement, um, knowledge co-production where appropriate, capacity building, science communication, and other, other diverse activities that strengthen uh, the Arctic research enterprise. And so essentially, even though uh, submissions would be in response to these particular objectives, uh, in fact, the submission process uh, would be going towards the, the Arctic research opportunities. So um, for, for those of you interested in, in, in that, um, you know, please take a look at this, at this Dear Colleague letter um, and then reach out to either Colleen Strawhacker or myself, who are the, the Cognizant Program Officers on this Dear Colleague letter. We can help, uh, you we can help guide you to uh, the, the appropriate means of, of submitting. Um, let me... So I'm sure we don't have Lisa joining us today, um, but I will also indicate that there are a number of uh, funding opportunities associated with education activities. Uh, there's one on improving undergraduate STEM education um, titled Pathways into the Earth, Ocean, Polar and Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences. Um, and so again, that ties into STEM education and training. Uh, Lisa would be your, your first best resource uh, for additional information there. Um, and along those same lines, um, there's a Dear Colleague letter that's published and available uh, that focuses on support for engaging students in the public in polar research. So a little bit uh, with that outreach, public outreach and science communication activities. Um, so Lisa Rahm, again, would be your, your first and best resource for additional information on that. I think we'll move on. Thanks. Cool. Now I get to talk about other, other opportunities um, because Bunch of them are, are specifically within the cyber realm. So the first is Earth Cubes that's run under the Geoscience Directorate. You're probably familiar with it. Um, it's been around for a few years, but it's about enabling science and data resource adoption. Really broad uh, range of focus areas um, around solving computational bottlenecks to answer geoscience questions, uh, things about making data open, making data fair, that acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, building understanding of data provenance and, and facilitating data reuse. So the deadline for that is March 2nd. Um, and I'm pretty sure that this is the last expected year on EarthCube. Um, there's also a, oh yeah. And so your points of contact for that are gonna be either me or Mark Stiglitz. Um, we'll also be your points of contact for this uh, dear colleague letter out on research and research coordination and planning opportunities um, for geo and AI. Uh, so that's out of the geo directorate research coordination networks with a maximum funding of three hundred thousand dollars as well as eagers um, for eagers they must have prior approval from the cognizant program officer um, so as the name says there's a focus on geo themed artificial intelligence uh, and geo is especially interested in research activities which might lead to future successful proposals for ai institutes um, or future nsf ai investments um, harnessing the data revolution is another one of NSF's 10 big ideas, um, and there are a range of different opportunities available within that. So it's an NSF wide solicitation being led by the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. Um, and so the two we're highlighting here are the Institutes for Data Intensive Research in Science and Engineering, as well as the Data Science Core. Um, and it's HDR's focus is on enabling new modes of data-driven discovery that will address fundamental questions at the research, at the intersection and frontiers of science and engineering. And so those have a deadline of January 21st. Um, and then one of these things is not like the others. There's a new solicitation out on mid-career investment. And so that's NSF-wide. And it's an opportunity for scientists and engineers at the associate professor level or equivalent to substantively advance their research program and career trajectory through other new opportunities. It can provide a relief of, of teaching duties, provide new connections and training. Another colleague has often described it as, as retooling your, your skill set and connections at the middle of your career as a way to help retain um, a diversity of people within the, the community. Um, and so that includes funding for academic year support. Um, there are a number of unique requirements, such as a letter from a department chair, and the deadline is the 1st of February. Um, I also forgot to put it in this slide, but I wanted to mention there's another uh, 
possible solicitation of interest out on cyber training. And so that's accepting proposals in particular for building capacity in computational and cyber infrastructure skills. Uh, the deadline for that is on January 21st as well. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. And then I think we have a couple of slides on RSL. Uh, Jen, you wanna take it? Yeah, I can start out. Um, so hello again, everyone. Um, so I think some of the biggest news we have is that we do have a new prime support contractor for Arctic Logistics, and that is Battelle. Um, and Battelle has partnered with several other uh, subcontractors. So together, that group makes up Battelle Arctic Research Operations. Uh, two of those subcontractors will be familiar to many of you. That is Polar Field Services and UIC Science um, up on the North Slope. They also are partnered with Stantec for engineering support, um, Stantec's Alaska offices, and then UC Denver for medical support um, and the San Diego Supercomputing Center for IT support. So it's those five entities. And you can um, reach the planning science planning group um, through this email right here. And then also there is the new website link for our contracted logistics support there. So. Um, you know, please visit, please visit that website and reach out to your planners. Um, and then uh, I think Frank, do you want to talk just a little bit about Mosaic and your, uh, well, we can celebrate the success of Mosaic and then talk about your expectations for Alaska and vessels for the upcoming year? Sure. Yeah, Mosaic was a large effort that uh, was successfully accomplished over the past year uh, on the vessel, uh, the, ice, the German icebreaker Polarstern. Uh, we were able to get people back and forth to Europe using uh, PPE during their travel and quarantine uh, before traveling to the vessel. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, ongoing science activities and data uh, integration and analysis for Mosaic, and that'll continue for several more years. Um, we're also supporting uh, field work in Alaska through the hubs. Um, in Fairbanks, uh, Tulik Field Station, north of the Brooks Range and Ukyadvik, as well as other locations. Uh, and so we're really looking forward to uh, gathering the requirements for the projects and uh, through the, the contract and then um, encouraging researchers to be realistic about their, their needs and requirements and be responsible about uh, continuing to socially distance, uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, and do whatever you can both before, during, and after uh, your planned field work to, to keep, uh, keep COVID out of the Arctic and, and not be a vector into any of the communities. Thanks, Frank. And following on um, on that, well, I'll talk a little bit about Greenland. So Summit Station is operating currently. We do have the winter crew up there. They went in in August. They will come out in February. Uh, and we are planning, we are currently in the planning process for the field operations for all of Greenland in 2021. We're working closely with the government of Greenland and the um, Air National Guard 109th to plan for those activities. Um, we do plan to support research. Uh, Greenland is currently closed to international visitors. So that means that we have to negotiate any entry into Greenland as we did for this past year. Um, so we are encouraging everyone to travel, to plan their travel through New York via the military flights out of there um, so that we can uh, get everybody into the same process for, for uh, that we'll be negotiating for entry. Um, and we're, and people are, should be prepared for approximately two weeks of additional travel time up front on their, their field work schedules to accommodate um, quarantine and COVID testing requirements. And what that's looking like right now is probably it's a, a three and three process where people will be asked to um, be responsible at home um, you know, in the week prior to departing their homes, continue to social distance, don't attend any large gatherings, et cetera, then they will have to, you will have to get a test uh, before you leave home, a COVID test. If that's negative, then you would travel on to New York where you will quarantine for five days in New York. Um, so we'll be working with everyone to facilitate those quarantines and then uh, get another COVID test in New York um, prior to the flight to 
Greenland. Um, upon arrival in Greenland, then is an additional five day quarantine and a third COVID test. So um, obviously the at home part is uh, managing your interactions and social contacts responsibly. So it's not, it's not truly a quarantine um, that it's about 12 days to two weeks that we're asking people to plan for starts when you leave your home and head to New York and then ends in Greenland once you're released after your third COVID test. Um, so I think that's all I have on that slide, Kate. I'm sure there will be questions on these topics. We can talk more in detail. Then. Yeah, and then I think yeah, Renee has more on the logistics stuff. Yeah, so we've uh, touched a little bit on the global pandemic and the impacts that COVID-19 has had. It's been a scourge for humanity and has definitely disrupted field research for people. Um, I wanted to highlight that you know, when we initially found out about COVID, um, in January, and we ramped up our efforts to plan for it in February, we developed a goal-based approach. And the primary goals remain the health and safety of our program participants and preventing the introduction or spread of COVID-19 to communities or research stations in the Arctic. And so all of the architecture that we've developed around COVID-19 protocols is really with this goal in mind and the health and safety of everyone who participates in our program and the communities where we work. Um, Jennifer and Frank both alluded to some of the protocols that we have in place that I'll describe a little bit. Um, but it's NSF's expectation that everyone who travels with support from NSF or our contractor will follow the quarantine and, and testing protocols that we've developed with this goal in mind. And also there are institutional, federal, international, state, local, regional, tribal travel restrictions in place as well that need to be complied with. And it can be a lot to keep track of, um, but we've been able to do, you know, successfully implement some field work in 2020. And um, we are anticipating being able to do even more in 2021. So Jen mentioned field team members should anticipate about two weeks of quarantine um, prior to going to field sites and testing usually at the beginning and end of quarantine. And there's some variation depending on whether people are working in Alaska or Greenland or other locations. Um, similarly, if they're working on vessels, there's um, isolation or yeah, uh, quarantine and testing protocols as well. Tulik Field Station in Alaska determined um, what capacity of people they could have at the station and still maintain physical distancing. And so it's a reduced capacity, but still um, capable of having researchers go there and, and similarly in Utkiagvik, um, following um, any local travel restrictions as well, it's possible for people to work on the North Slope. And Jen mentioned that we have had to do all the travel to Greenland on a uh, case by case special permission basis, working with our colleagues in Greenland and Denmark and State Department. So it's it's possible, but there, there are some complications. So. Um, in 2020, we asked people to postpone their field work and not try to go to the field. In 2021, we are going to try to meet, um, make up some of that 2020 field season work and perform all the 2021 field work that was already in, in the queue. Um, and that's our goal. We want everyone to meet the research objectives that they set out in their original proposal. And we are trying to work with everyone to accomplish those goals we are unlikely to be able to add anything extra um, because there's budget constraints and um, limitations on numbers of people who can travel and that kind of thing. So um, everyone should be working with their program, science program manager and wherever needed, um, the research support and logistics staff are available to help as well. And then I have this one is Simon. Um, Take this one. I think this is mostly a okay, plug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think this is basically you know we we rely on your feedback. Um, you know, we've given you a lot of information uh, in the last uh, forty nine minutes. Um, but we, you know, we rely on your, your feedback, your interactions with program offices. We actually haven't said this. We've said this in all of our other 
previous COVID uh, presentations, they haven't down talk to your program officer. Um, so I'll say it here: if in doubt, talk to your program officer um, and uh, uh, or your logistics program uh, officer. So, you know, just as Renee just said, we we do, we really do rely on um, you know working with you to make your project a success. If it, if you don't have a project, if you're thinking about proposals, um, again, reach out to the. Uh, program offices that you've uh, been introduced to in this presentation, um, and uh, and we you know we we rely on your feedback. We look forward to hearing from you. We we want uh, we want projects that we funded to be a success. We also want new projects to be proposed, even though we are going through obviously you know very uh, trying times. Thanks, Simon. And yeah, and, and then I'll put a plug in for uh, Terry Dillian. I, th I think we also also want to hear um, all the successes that you guys are having in terms of publishing. So if you guys are getting ready to submit something to a journal and, and you would like to amplify the results, um, NSF has kind of increased their um, efforts on that end through OPA and uh, Terry Dillian in, is the contact for the Office of Polar Programs for anything media related. I think it, I think they would like to see things before um, they're published through the journal. So that would be the optimum time to reach out to either your science program officer if you can't remember Terry. And then usually the science program officer can also pass that through um, to the media people as well. And so that'll get um, results you know, just through the channels that NS has, NSF has for, for those relationships. And then always, um, I think everybody would also appreciate everybody's efforts on panelists and peer reviews and other advisory committees. Um, I think we all know that none of the work happens without this community. And I think with that, we're uh, happy Can to- Can I put up? This oh, is yeah, Mark. Sure, I'd just like to put a plug in for um, rotators. Looking for rotators, having rotators come to NSF, it's really important that you bring fresh ideas um, to the Arctic Sciences section. Um, right now we have um, two positions that we're looking for. One is an IPA rotator for ANS, and that's to complement our current expertise with somebody in with a, a strong background in physical oceanography, chemical oceanography, or biological oceanography. And I think Roberto as well wanted to say just a word on this. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Uh, so similarly, uh, AON, the Arctic Observing Network program, is, is uh, seeking candidates to serve as an IP as a rotator to help with program management and also with uh, increasing interagency international scopes around Arctic observing. Uh, a lot of things are happening in, in that space. And so, um, yeah, love to have uh, any of you help join the team. If you're feeling interested, let us know. Uh, please contact us. Yeah, and I know that was a lot of information. Uh, usually when we do these webinars, we try to keep it short, but I think uh, kind of with AGU, uh, there was a lot to update in terms in, of just changes to the program and um, a lot of information that everybody wanted to share. So we do have about half an hour, I think, still blocked out for just a very open question and answer session. You can either take yourself off mute and just ask your question freely. You can put it in the chat either to everybody or privately to me or Liz if you don't want your name to be associated with it. Um, or you can raise your hand if somebody else is talking and then we'll know that you're in the queue next to have your answer question. Um, your question. It, <laughs> just as a reminder, if you haven't done it before, you can use the raise hand function through the participant list. And if you are on the phone, you can dial star six to unmute yourself and star nine to raise your hand. Um, we know sometimes when you're on the phone, it can be kind of hard to, to get a word in. So that star nine um, raise hand will let us know that you've got a question. Okay, so the floor is open. Any questions? There is one in the chat. 
Thanks. Uh, so do we anticipate, sorry, I lost it. Um, where, so the, the question is, thanks for the info, folks at or approaching the postdoc stage are in a particularly tough spot looking forward. Do you anticipate added NSF funding opportunities or changes in funding philosophies that will direct support to postdoc stipends? I don't know who wants to take this one. I can, I can take a stab um and then open it up to my colleagues so thank you for that question that is one that we've thought a lot about um both within this section and at nsf um there are new um funding opportunities that are already out there that support early career researchers so um the ocean sciences has a new postdoc program um, we have the new doctoral dissertation research improvement grant. Um, we cannot talk about any solicitations that may be in development. Um, we don't want to give you an unfair advantage if you're in here and um, you hear about something that other people don't know about yet. Um, that being said, we always are looking for feedback on how we can better support you. Um, there are certainly ways that we can um, kind of support uh, early career researchers in other ways. Um, reach out to your program officer if you have any concerns. Um, we can, um, there are options to provide supplements to active awards. Um, if um, you're, you're almost out of money in your currently funded project. So there are a couple of different ways you can do it. But again, I think the, the major theme that we'll be talking, that we've talked about over the past hour is your, your program officer is going to be um, your best resource in that. Um, do any of my other NSF colleagues have anything to add to that? Okay, thanks, Colleen. We'll move on to the next question from Emily Edom. Uh, people are eager to make up the 2020 fieldwork in 2021, uh, but they did not have the budget in their proposal for two weeks of quarantine, hotel, plus board, plus COVID test costs. Is it reasonable to request additional financial assistance? I'll, I'll start the answer to this one, and then Frank can follow. I see he's got his hand up. Um, we are working with our contractor to facilitate as much as possible the quarantines um, in Alaska and New York and Greenland. So that would be the hotel part of it and the uh, board and the testing part of it for those pieces of it. Um, and, uh, but, but that said, and the, the science POs might have some comments on this as well. Um, if, if you have other concerns, financial concerns, you should reach out to your science program officer and talk about those. We welcome those conversations um, and, and to, to help you solve problems. So uh, Frank, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, it, for, for uh, projects that involved uh, participation on ships, we're, we're working with the uh, UNOLS operators or if it's a contract vessel, we're working with the, the logistics contractor to try to address those requirements. Uh, as part of the project planning. So make sure you raise that issue with your project planner and, uh, and we can work to, uh, to meet those, re those needs. Yeah, we, did, we recognized early on that we didn't wanna supplement every individual grant um, to deal with the situation. And so it's a good observation that there, there is definitely a better way for us to support that um, than those individual funding requests. So thank you for that question. Um, since we're on COVID, I don't want to mess up the, the order too much, but I see there are two more COVID related questions down further yeah. in the chat. Yeah, we could um, just do you want to speak to those? That. Yeah, sure. So um, they're sort of related. Maybe I'll read the first one for yeah, how, okay. like, how long do you anticipate the travel restrictions quarantine will last? What are the criteria for relaxing the protocol? And then the follow on a second question is about the CDC guidance that's changing 14 from 10 from 14 to 10 days. And do we anticipate changing the amount of time for quarantine in Fairbanks prior to going to Tulik? And the overall arching answer is that we are using a risk based approach. We are following CDC guidance um, to the greatest extent possible, in addition to whatever other you know, state and um, international implemented travel restrictions there are. So with regard to how long will travel will quarantine last really until we have a cure or a vaccine that we know um, prevents people from being able to spread the disease. So there's definitely going to, you know, we're definitely headed into the early field season anticipating that we'll still be doing the quarantine and testing protocols that we've had. So we'll wait to see more about how the vaccination 
process evolves and the efficacy in addition to any improved treatments that are available. But we still do not want to be a vector of COVID-19 into the Arctic because the communities where we work do not have the facilities. They have largely aging populations. And we just don't want to be people who are bringing COVID-19 into, into the Arctic. We are looking at the 14 to 10 days, but again, we want a little bit more information. And um, the question is really, what do you gain by um, quarantining a little bit longer? And in some cases, we're interested in gaining the extra you know, percentage that we can get by quarantining. Um, so um, we'll stay tuned for more announcements. We do tend to put information out through OPP using announce our announcements um, page that you can get to from the OPP homepage as well as on our Facebook page and, um, and through our contractor. So I, we do consistently revisit what our protocols are and we'll be keeping these things in mind. Um, Jen or Frank, do you wanna add more? Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Well, I was just gonna say that it's, it's really, we're looking at the, uh, the published literature uh, re with respect to quarantine and testing and how that interplay works to reduce or minimize the risk um, and we'll continue to do that as we move through the season. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think for planning purposes, um, people should plan that they would need to follow these processes all the way through this next year, next field season. But you know, that's caveated with, we're continuing to watch the situation and things might change and we might be able to back off, but we're not, we're, we're planning to follow these processes. We are planning to follow these processes all the way through the field season and then perhaps we'll be able to back off at some point, but it's not the other way around where we're waiting to see when we can back off um, because we need to get planning in place. And then the other thing um, is part of the factor is not just when you or you or you on the screen can get vaccinated and then you're good to go. It's actually when the communities in the Arctic are vaccinated and, they're, and they are, are feeling that it's safe for people to come into their communities um, that they have resistance, they've built up resistance in their communities. And that's probably one of the biggest factors, um, but it's but it's a two-way street too. So we, we hope to have both sides vaccinated before we really even consider um, backing off on these requirements. Frank, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna add one more thing that we are working with uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, Institute of Arctic Biology and to uh, assess the population requirements at Tulick Field Station and to ensure that we can, you know, put people in single single rooms and and that's gonna have an impact on the planning. So we're gonna we're asking people to be realistic and to to utilize the remote uh, observation and measurement capabilities that are available there at Tulick and also in Ukiavik to try to keep your field uh, teams at a size that's manageable and can allow the whole portfolio to move forward uh, and uh, and kind of share share the capabilities that we will have. And there's one more question down here that I'll answer. I'll just I'll just or it's a comment um, that I'll respond to, and that is uh, from Caitlin saying that speaking for researchers with young children, four days can be a big difference, and we're aware of that, um, and that's why we're watching the situation so closely. Um, that's why it's a multi-step process for getting to Greenland because, and, and we've pushed back on, on some opinions that you know it should be 21 days. Last year, there were discussions about 21 days. So we've pushed back on some of those because it's really a delicate balance in trying to make something that is manageable um, for you and provide some, some degree of certainty that we're not going to create an outbreak in the Arctic. So it's, we, we are very aware of that concern and that, um, that challenge. Um, so we can back up there, Kate, I think. Yeah, yeah I can take the okay. next question on, on mid-career. Uh, so the question is for the mid-career advancement solicitation specifies that the associate professor rank or equivalent is the target. And could the or equivalent be seen as indicating research faculty eligibility to submit to the solicitation? And I saw that Colleen put in the chat, reach out to the cognizant program officers for sure. There are, if you scroll further down in the solicitation, um, there's a little bit more inf information on what qualifies as or equivalent in including having essentially research, teaching or service roles that you can be freed up from to be able to pursue these other opportunities. 
um, other things about aligning with the mission of your institution um, and things like that. So yes, but read read a little bit more into the into the solicitation to see if you qualify in particular. And then if you still have questions, reach out to those Cognizant program officers. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, and then the next uh, question comes from Adrian McCullen. Uh, it's a three part question. Uh, so can expedition field work be supported? Uh, for example, an ocean oceanographic transect via ski slash sled for six to eight weeks. Uh, he's Australian, so presumably he needs a US collaborator. So maybe you guys can talk about uh, the funding restrictions for uh, foreign researchers or foreign collaborators. Uh, and then is there a preferred form to seek collaborators? So I would start by saying that we don't accept proposals that are just for field expeditions, um, that the field logistics and support that we provide is for funded research projects. And then I would want to hand it over to Mark or uh, Roberto or Colleen or someone to address the other related issues in case it, About there that. is a science proposal here. Yeah. Frank had a about the logistics, maybe. Oh, good. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, with a funded research pro project, then it's a question of, uh, you know, where's, you know, what are the safety considerations related to the project and the transect as proposed? Uh, what's the extent of the requirements uh, for supporting the project? And, and whether the project would be, um, depending on where the funds are coming from, uh, whether it be in a reimbursable situation where the the project costs are are paid by the funding agency supporting the project or or the country supporting the project and uh, and how those agreements could be uh, developed. Um, so there's there's a lot there in that question or that, that series of questions. And you would need to have a U.S. collaborator um, for a project. I would say um, add that in terms of who is eligible to submit proposals, every solicitation has a list of eligible um, institutions that are able to apply. And also, I'm surprised that we did not once mention our PAPG. Oh, what? <laughs> so this is the the big giant monster document, um, the PAPG, which is our I'm proposal preparation something guide. <laughs> like how many acronyms? Sorry, it's late and it's late in the AGU week. Um, but essentially, thanks, Alan, for popping that into the chat. But essentially, this is going to be your master um, directions for submitting a proposal um, to NSF. Do not read the whole thing. Look for the information that you need. Um, but that will also provide information on um, who is eligible to submit proposals to. And this actually might um, be helpful for um, JJ's question, too. Um, so I'll read that out for anyone who may be on the phone. Thank Thank you also to Ellen for popping in the acronym to the proposal and award policies and procedures guide. I am embarrassed that I did not know that off the top of my head. Um, okay, so JJ's question. My question concerns award administration for small businesses in the context of um, proposal submission. We do not have a negotiated indirect cost rate. Can you explain the procedure for grant admin for small businesses um, absent this um, indirect cost rate? What if any fees are allowed, allowable? Okay, again, um, refer to the PAPG, um, it'll provide information. Um, I believe if you don't have an indirect cost rate, you just, um, it's a baseline 10% um, that you will be able to claim as your indirect cost rate. Um, really, when you get into kind of the nitty gritty of these budget questions, um, I know at least I tend to gloss over with some of those questions. So I rely on my colleagues um, in, on the administrative side of the house at NSF. But if you have more specific questions than that, feel free to reach out to your program officer and we can connect you with um, kind of the, the people who really know those rules in and out and we can figure out how to set up your budget. Great. Uh, and then we have another question from uh, Michael Weintraub. Uh, with COVID quarantine testing guidance for Alaska field work different, differ between Tulik and other locations. Uh, for example, travel to the West Brooks via Kotzebue in his case. How would it work if I want to travel between Tulik and our sites in the West Brook range uh, on the same trip? Yeah, so, 
So if you're working with the logistics contractor, I would, I would discuss this with the planners. It, the, really, it's the devil's in the details. It depends on whether you're having contact with communities or if you're uh, trying to reach a, a, a cache of supplies that, that have been staged without any, any contact. Um, and if you're going from one location to another, there's probably going to be a, a requirement for another quarantine, at least a, a, a shorter quarantine with testing just to ensure that uh, that there's no um, no danger to, to any of the communities that you're interacting with. Uh, so really, I would encourage you to work with the uh, with the planners and and uh, describe the requirements and then let them work out what what the options might be. And then we can we can discuss those options and constraints. Great, thanks Frank. Um, that's all the questions we have right now. Maybe while you guys think of some more, um, I, I know uh, Bev Walker had also submitted a link to a separate opportunity. Bev, what was the name of that one again? It was the work-life balance one. Yes, yeah, so there's um, a, a new um, Dear Colleague letter that was um, sent out by NSF um, in or earlier in November. Um, and it's about a career life balance supplemental funding requests. Um, and it has some expanded definitions from what was um, previously available through that same process. Um, so do check out that if um, you think that might be helpful for your research needs. Great. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from everybody? Uh, it's a rare chance you get all of us in one space. Okay, here we go. Uh, could shield, field teams share accommodations at Tulik? Uh, they will likely be sharing vehicles to reach the station. Yeah, so that'll be a, a question for UAF. Uh, you know, IAB is developing protocols for Tulik through their cooperative agreement with NSF. And, and then we're, we're having conversations between IAB and the logistics contractor to ensure that our policies are, are fairly consistent uh, across institutional boundaries. So again, it's, it's really writing down um, the procedures you're gonna follow and, and the process, and then we'll evaluate the different uh, potential issues that arise to, to figure out what would be possible or not. Thanks so much. Yeah, and then uh, Yaro had a question in the comment, I think related to the career life balance, asking if it was relevant only to folks taking leave due to COVID. Um, and I, I think Alan said he doesn't believe it is, but maybe you, you can yeah, I'm, I'm, to be honest, looking at the DCL on my other screen right now, but it, it's an older program that was initiated pre-COVID. Um, whether you have to take leave or not, I, I believe that you someone does have to take family leave or, or dependent care leave, and it's uh, an opportunity to be able to, to fill that gap. I would also just like to highlight, as you've seen over the past 75 minutes or so, there are dozens upon dozens of opportunities at NSF right now. And because um, we cover a lot of ground in our section, um, we touch on a lot of them. Um, and while we do know our solicitations inside and out, there are a lot of solicitations that we don't work directly on. Um, and so that's why we always say to, to co contact the program officers who are listed on the solicitation. Um, they know they've, they've thought about these things deeply and they can provide you um, the answers on those. So um, again, I think that's gonna be your best bet um, to, to figure out some of the, the details on those solicitations. And Kate, there was also a question about rotators too, a little bit further up. Um, Maybe Simon should take that. It's a general question just to talk more about rotators. I thought at first that they meant airplanes, but I think they mean people. <laughs> Simon should answer it. <laughs> I think it's his rotators, not mine. Yeah, so if you're uh, interested in uh, 
potentially coming to NSF. Uh, I think Mark was the one who raised this issue um, as a program officer. Uh, you know, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, either your current program officer, or myself, or uh, you know, the, the the person you you seem to like the most on this uh, presentation, um, and uh, ask. You know, I asked them about uh, you know, what what does this mean? NSF relies on rotators. Uh, I think, as as Mark said, uh, to to bring in um, you know current thinking from the community. Um, we have a variety of mechanisms to do so, uh, and, and you know, some of the, the folks in our team are are rotators. Um, so yeah, please, please do reach out to us, um, either in your program or to myself, if you don't have a specific program, because um, uh, we, you know, we are very interested uh, and rely on rotators as, uh, as, as, as part of the NSF system for uh, program management. Simon, I, I dropped in a link to some general information about rotators, including the IPA. And so that could be a first stop just for some general information and then um, and then reach out to us as appropriate. Maybe Mark wants to say something about what was useful about being an IPA uh, from the from the IPA side. What did you get out of it? From the IPA side, you know, it was it was really a wonderful experience. I mean, it was just not like anything uh, I had in the university. You, you're coming at things from the other side. Um, you're, you're working with a group of people that all have the same aim, which is to make the science work. And, it, and it's really neat that everybody does that. Um, I, I found the first year, one of the things about becoming a rotator is the first year is hard. The first year, there's just so much being pushed on you and um, that it's sort of like a fire hose and in the second year you become hopefully um, useful. But it's, it's, it was, to me, it was a great experience. And, um, you know, you got to learn, you, you not only, you not only got to, you had learned about your area. When you get there, you, you frequently find that, uh, you know, I'm interested in something else. So for me, it was, uh, it was, I worked with the uh, Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure quite closely on, on things like high performance computing and whatnot. So you get to see other areas, work with other people that are not really in your discipline. Um, and then you bring things back to your university. People really want to know, you know, what did you learn there? What, what are the things um, that make the place work? And um, so, so I did spend three years and then I went back to my university and, and came back to NSF permanently. And, um, but really it's the people. It, it's a really exciting place to work and it's exciting to go through. It's, it's really exciting to go through a couple of panels of your own, the ones that you sort of walk through the system where you take things from start to end. So, um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, I mean, do you have anything to add? I saw you come off mute. Uh, no, but I also started to read some of the other uh, questions that you were reading, Kate. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so the next one comes from uh, Twyla. I think she was hoping some, for some perspective from NSF on a uh, COVID impacts, uh, for example, proposal pressure, uh, under or oversubscribed solicitations, uh, review panels, or any other observations that you guys might have that you can share with the larger community. Simon, did, do you want to take that one? I think Carl is asking for some numerical data, and I don't yeah. know that we have it. Um, I know that NSF is gathering those data, and um, I think that proposals are being processed, program officers are working, 
few people are taking leave <laughs> and uh, really just doing the work. I think, uh, and other program officers should chime in, that virtual panels have been working and have been very effective. Um, it's not ideal, but I think the work of NSF in terms of proposal processing, um, producing solicitations and things like that has been really spot on. Uh, there, and there may be data to bear this out, um, you know, later in, in uh, 2021 as we get more of the you know, actual data analyzed, but. Yeah, and I, I mean. I understand. No, I was going to say, well, Arctic was mostly doing virtual panels before, um, with the exception of the navigating the new Arctic, kind of before COVID happened. So uh, I think this community and this set of program officers were kind of uniquely ready to uh, kind of be operating in that way anyways. And then any information kind of related to proposals and in terms of like the numbers of proposals that are submitted to NSF, the success rates, they have to go through a series of clearances before being shared with um, the larger community. So there's nothing specific that these guys can really say in terms of um, pressure or oversubscription. Um, but I think NSF as a whole is doing um, a larger look at the impacts of that and, and in the future um, will be released probably on a foundation wide basis. And I think it's always interesting for us to understand what the implications have been for the research community that, and the poll gives us you know, one piece of information, but uh, that it's been more challenging to submit proposals or other, other impacts that are happening, um, you know, that, that are things that are harder for us to see. It's always good to hear that, that feedback as well. Alan, you went off mute. I think you might have more to add. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I, I have no idea whether this is directly because of COVID or because I started 10 weeks ago. Um, but, you know, in the poll, one of the, the things that was noted was that the challenges with fieldwork and fieldwork planning. And so I've been getting questions and having discussions with people about where does data reuse fit in, you know, pivoting to that, you know, the Arctic data center is a wonderful resource for the, the community and, and there can be very, you know, hypothesis driven or exploratory driven research based on existing data, as well as things that may fit within a broader CI program of, of facilitating data reuse in other ways. Um, so, like I said, I don't know if that's a change, but I know that it's happening. And hopefully we, we see more of it. Yeah, and I think the Arctic Data Center actually had some introductory sessions associated with AGU, I think, in the town hall. So if you're interested in kind of learning more about that resource, uh, you should, I think, um, Arcus actually has a, uh, a website of Arctic sessions collated um, for, right, there we go, we have the Arctic Data Center, Data Center webinar next week. Um, that they've collated for uh, AGU itself. And so you can go in there and search for it there too. And I'll try to find that link and put it in the chat real fast as well. Yeah, and Liz just noted that they're having um, one of these IARPIC wide webinars for the Arctic Data Center next week too, um, which will be a really good resource um, for people. Maybe I'll come back for a moment to some of the um, other efforts that Alan spoke about. Um, some of the ones that come out of OHC. One of the reasons, um, think about these opportunities. If you're a person who, who fits into the categories for some of these, these efforts, um, they're real opportunities. Your, your work may not precisely fit into hypothesis-driven science, but yet you may be wanting to build a model um, to do some science, but not in particular to do the science. Some of these larger Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure um, projects are a real opportunity. They also have very substantial budgets, and they're also opportunities for us. If a proposal ranks highly, um, the, the cost to us is usually somewhere 50% or less. So, so if you are uh, someone who really wants to explore some of these um, efforts coming out of there, um, it's a real opportunity for funding.
Okay. We'll do a last call for questions and then, or go ahead. Adam. I, I just realized, I'm not sure we've, I was looking back at the, at the questions. I'm not really sure we answered the third part of Adrian's question about finding collaborators. Um, and the, the place I would immediately send you to is IORPIC Collaborations uh, website, that there are tons of great different um, standing teams as well as self-forming teams. And people have their profiles built out with their expertise there as well. Um, so you could either make a post inviting collaborators or, or find individual people to reach out to as well. Yeah, and you just have to create a um, like a profile for that, but anyone can join. Um, yeah, you don't have to be a, a U.S. researcher to to be a part of of IRB collaborations. But I'm sure Liz uh, or Kate could add more to that. <laughs> yeah, I can add. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat. That is how you can sign up for an account. Anyone who does anything in the Arctic research space is welcome to join, whether you're in the U.S. or abroad. Um, we do ask you to fill out how you can help, but that's mostly so that we know that you're a real person. Um, we're not going to say, oh, you can't help enough. Um, we really want you. Um, and IARPA Collaborations has you know, 2,500, 2,600 um, researchers and other science affiliates um, there. So if you're looking for a collaboration, uh, it's a really good place to start. Okay. Well, uh, as you guys think of maybe some last questions, I think we all just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out to um, spend with us. I know that's a long time to <laughs> to devote, especially in AG week, and it's a lot of information that we pass along. Um, this will be recorded and will be posted on the Arabic website that um, you went to to register. So that's if that's a good place to go to um, kind of rehash any of the information that you've probably already forgotten from 45 minutes ago. <laughs> and I think as always, um, just if you have any questions, feel free to contact anybody. I think this is an amazing group and all they wanna do is make sure that people feel supported in getting their research done. Uh, I'll pass it on to anyone else to closing comments. All right. Yeah, I'm well, sure we all want to say thank you to everyone. We had almost 100 people at some point. I'm not sure, but I, I really appreciate folks listening in. We hope to convey information about funding opportunities. And as always, reach out to any of us, and we'll try to steer you in the right direction. Thank you to everyone at NSF for joining us today for this IRPIC webinar. And thank you to everyone who joined us for the presentations and the Q&A. Um, as folks have mentioned, um, the recording will be posted. If not today, then probably tomorrow. Um, and if you've got questions about IRPIC collaborations, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'd love to see you all on the site. And just one final note, we put a lot of links in the chat. If you haven't done this before, you can click the little three dot button down in the chat box and you can save the, the chat transcript to your own computer as well. So you don't have to wait on us for, for recordings and stuff. Sorry to mess up your, your really nice bow on the end of the webinar there. <laughs> no worries. I will also do my best to transfer all of the um, links over into the event page when I post the recording. All right, with that, I am going to end the webinar, but thank you again um, and look forward to Everyone. seeing you all at future webinars. Everyone, have a good evening. Bye now. Bye. Bye.